Welcome to Arts for the Health of It, a podcast where you will discover creative ways to improve your health and well being. Someone may have told you that art isn't for you, but they were wrong. Anyone can create arts for the health of it, no talent or experience necessary. I'm just a little songbird, try to fly my way homeward with the melody, and I make the beat. Don't know where it'll take me, take me. Cause when I'm in the dark of night, I sing my way back to the light. Come along with me, and your heart will see that a song changes everything. Oh. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Arts for the Health of It, uh, the podcast. I'm your host, Richard Wilmore. And I'm your co-host, Constanza Rader. If you've ever wondered how the arts can look fully when it's fully integrated into a healthcare system, then you are going to love this episode. We got yes. to talk with Shay Thornton Kula at the Center for Performing Arts Medicine at Houston Methodist. And they have one of the largest arts and health programs in the nation. Uh, and it was just fascinating and so exciting to hear about all the things that they're doing right now. And, if and have done. Yes. And if you've never thought about it, watch <laughs> it and listen too, because it is fascinating. I love her excitement and enthusiasm. I mean, we just kind of sat there the entire time and let her go because oh, she has so, they're, they're doing so much there. And, yeah. and the excitement is like bubbling through her. And so it was just fascinating to listen to yeah. her. They're doing oh. some really exciting new research and studies, which we'll have her back on again to talk about some of the results of some of the cool stuff that they're doing. Um, and she also shared some exclusive um, resources that you can access virtually and she shares about how to do that um, toward the end of, of the episode today. Uh, Shay Thornton Kula is a passionate arts administrator with a specialty for bridging the gap between the arts and community and the health and business fields. She is currently the manager of operations for the Center for Performing Arts Medicine and is responsible for the strategy, implementation, and financial management of one of the most comprehensive arts in healthcare organizations in the country, as well as spearheading the arts integration department. I mean, she just, this <laughs> is why she fun. knows everything because she's doing everything. <laughs> and we're so thankful that she uh, sat down this afternoon and, or to talk to us. So uh, without further ado, here's our interview with Shay. Enjoy. Just for the upgrading <laughs> graphics, yes. Um, Shay, you have, I think probably the longest title to try to fit on a graphic in the entire world. You have three names. I do have three names. And then you're the operations manager for the Center of Performing Arts Medicine at Houston Methodist. I mean, who came up with all of that? I mean, I'm not quite sure, but I know that each one of those are super important. So I'm gonna double check your work okay. and make sure that all of it is on there. Uh -huh. You should. We, I will record it again if it's not. Let us know and we can come back and re-record. Perfect. Perfect. Well, that's right. My name is Shay Thornton Kula and I'm the Ops Manager for the Center for Performing Arts Medicine. And we are a fully integrated arts and health department inside of a hospital. So we're a little bit different than some other arts organizations that exist outside of the hospital and do the programming inside. We are Houston Methodist employees. We're badged employees of the hospital system that every day we report into the hospital itself, which is great. It offers up us some opportunities to really be integrated into the healthcare environment. But it is funny coming from an arts background to be like, oh, I never I never thought I would be working in the med center. I never thought I would be walking in every day to a hospital setting. Um, it's interesting how as artists, oftentimes we have a little bit of um, bravery to step into these situations and try to see what can I add to this and how, how can I be a part of this? And a, a big part of it is just listening and learning and seeing 
where you are and what needs to be done and figuring out ways to use the arts to do that. What I get to do is look at all of our programs, right? So we have programs for patients, we have programs for employees, we have programs for the community members and see what needs to happen to make all of those um, like work and kind of prioritize and say, where are we gonna put our time resources, our money resources, our opportunities? Where is that all gonna lay out? Because there's no shortage of really great ideas or opportunities, but we are, we do need to figure out how can we work in the most effective way. Also being an artist or an art um, arts organization in a healthcare setting, we have to make sure that all of the work that we do is incredibly well thought out and purposeful and appropriate for that setting. So we never want to just start a program and be like, well, let's see how it goes. We need to make sure that we're speaking to all those different stakeholders and understanding really what's happening in that space. For example, one project I was just working on this morning, um, it's a serenity room on uh, in a, so it's a serenity room on a COVID floor. So for nurses to be able to take some space out of their day, not in a break room and just be able to relax. So when we first went into this conversation with the nurse manager on that floor, really what I first heard was, oh, it's COVID floor and oh, this is nurses. And, you know, we want to create like this restful, relaxing place. And I immediately had, you know, 14 ideas about what that could be. But then after talking with Sheila and really hearing what she wanted for this space and what those nurses or what that clinical staff was voicing their needs and how they were utilizing it already, we came up with something completely different. And there's a spiritual element on it. There's a plant wall, a live plant wall where mm. nurses or clinical staff can ad adopt a plant. And that, that means it's theirs to take care of, just like they're caring for their patients. It's another opportunity for them to kind of tend and, and really look at it and have it be this peaceful moment. There's um, massage chairs and this really good foot massager. Mm -hmm. I won't give you the code to the unit door, uh, <laughs> but I will say that it's a really good foot massager. Then this inter then this interview is over. If I'm not getting <laughs> it's all about the, the code, code <laughs> you're out of here. Kick her out. Okay, well, maybe I just won't say it online. That's what <laughs> all right, all right. Um, And then there's a wall that is all of our employee artwork. So some pieces of employee artwork that are um, kind of reflective in nature and make you feel like you're in this much bigger space than you actually are. And they're printed on vinyl. And then next to the vinyl are these large um, kind of uh, prompts for relaxation or prompts for a meditation. So people can either use it just to look at the images or use these reflective prompts to kind of take a few minutes out of their day. Um, but what I think was the really important lesson on that project, just like all the other ones we've worked on, is that we can go into a room and maybe be artistically minded and say, oh, this is what we should do. It should be creative writing all the time or it should be whatever, whatever we're thinking of that day, whatever gives us some energy. But then um, really having that conversation and those needs guided by that unit gives us an opportunity to create something that's going to be meaningful for them and mm -hmm. reflective of their specific culture um, and, and unit identity there. Which is, So it's been a, a fun project to work on. Um, I will say huge shout out to them. They were our first unit to turn COVID a year plus ago, oh, right? Wow. And they are they're just incredible. They're so strong. They're so positive. And getting to work on this project and feeling like you get to be a teeny tiny part of their team has been very inspiring to me. And it feels nice to be able to support those that are the frontline caregivers. Oh, and it's so important right now with burnout on the rise and mental health challenges that our healthcare workers are facing right now. Like it's such important work and that's so cool that you get to be a part of it um, in, in your, in your healthcare system, which I'd love to, back up just a little bit and see if you could talk about kind of the origins of the Center for Performing Arts Medicine, because I know it's gone, I know it started as something different than, a little bit different than it is doing now. So could you talk a little bit about that? Totally. You absolutely teed me up for a really good commercial, sure. because <laughs> this year 
We are celebrating our 25th anniversary of the Center for Performing Arts Medicine. Um, and you're right, when, it, when we were originally formed by Dr. Stasny, it looked completely different than it does now. Uh, Dr. Stasny is this incredible ENT physician and um, he was known as the opera doc. So he, could, he had opera singers come from across the country, across the globe and say, hey doc, I, I'm having this throat problem or hey, I need to get back on stage tonight, what can you do? Um, and he was so dedicated to, the, to those artists and tried to find ways to care for them, just like we care for sports medicine or our athletes, looking at artists' health and seeing their unique healthcare needs and putting them back on stage as quick as we could. And that led to us being the official healthcare providers for the Houston Symphony, the Houston Grand Opera, and the Houston Ballet, meaning like, for example, at the Houston Ballet, if you walk into their center for dance, they have a full Houston Methodist clinic. And mm -hmm. every day there's athletic trainers from Methodist, there's massage therapists from Methodist, our orthopedists are there all the time, so that we're not only providing them a healthy environment to work in, but also extending their careers. And as mm -hmm. artists, we know, especially in performing arts, our, our bodies are the tool. And if we're not properly taking care of that tool, we're not able to perform most effectively. Mm -hmm. um, so it started in that, started Artist Healthcare. And then as all of these opera singers were coming to Stasny, he, they, they started to have other needs, right? Oh, my hip hurts. Oh, I have this thing with my knee. Started to realize that, you know, he could take care of everything from your shoulder up, but below that he needed some help. So he started kind of getting this group of physicians together. He would pull an orthopedist from there. He'd pull an internist from there. He'd pull all the different kinds of, um, physicians that you would need to care for an artist um, and created this center. So all of these docs, right now we have a, a, a large roster of doctors that all are committed to getting artists back on stage as soon as possible and understanding their unique healthcare needs. So we have this artist card, you can sign up for it, it's completely free. And it's basically, so if you come to one of our hospitals, you're coded as this artist and they'll know to alert, first they'll alert CPAM, and second, they'll make sure that the, any of the docs caring for you that day will know that you're an artist. For example, maybe you're an opera singer, and you don't want to be, you wouldn't want to be intubated, right? That could, that could hurt your cord. So they'll try to come up with other um, ways to care for you as specifically as you need to be an artist. Um, and so when Stasny and team were caring for all of these artists, they came back and said, thank you so much. We want to give back to you now. And that's how this, that's how CPM started to get some legs. Our mission is to effectively translate the power of the arts into the healthcare environment. And we see that happening in four or five different ways. The first one is artist healthcare. So treating artists and caring for artists in that unique way. The second one came from the artists themselves. They said, thank you so much. You got me back on stage. What can I do for you? And mm -hmm. kind of casually, Dr. Stassi was like, oh, just go down to the lobby and, you know, perform. And of course, <laughs> they were willing to. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Sing as the ballet brings your car. <laughs> oh, and I joke. I mean, it wasn't just like that. But, it, you know, I love the idea that we all know artists and, and we all know that feeling of wanting to give and wanting to perform. And what can I do in return? And so we started a, um, a performing art series here at Houston Methodist. It's a fully endowed series, meaning that it'll exist for perpetuity. It's called the Margaret Alkeck Williams Crane Garden Performance Series. You thought you I had really a long enjoy title. your long names there, don't you? I know, right? <laughs> I think part of it is like mental, like cues to remember all of these words together like we're gonna have to start coming up with some analogies or right. or whatnot um <laughs> but we are the only fully endowed uh, performance series in the country at a hospital which is awesome mm. wow. and in non-covid times don't you wish we could stop saying non -COVID i know i'm so tired of it <laughs> me too um we were one of the most active performing venues in the city of houston with mm. over 100 performances a year our lobbies you know were always full and active with with music and dance and theater and uh, creative writing and spoken word and all sorts of different kinds of programming that was reflective of the environment of care at Methodist. And we think of that environment of care is um, 
trying to create a wraparound environment where the healthcare experience is humanized by the art. So it's not just some elevator music playing beautifully in the lobby, but it's music that will kind of meet you where you are that day and help guide you on your journey towards wellness. Maybe that means you're a nurse and you're um, heading up to your shift or you're just running down and getting coffee real quick as a a loved one. Maybe it means you're a patient and you're nervous to go into your procedure this morning. We have seven staff pianists that play 365 days a year Mm. on Christmas, on Easter, on all the holidays. Um, And one of them actually starts at 540 in the morning. So he catches a lot of those people coming in for surgery. Um, And he's one of our most beloved. He's been with Methodist for 12 years now. He thinks it's the greatest gig. We think it's the greatest (laughs) gig for him. Um, So really looking at what are the needs of the hospital? When are people coming? And and why is it important to have music? And what does that music look like? Making sure that that music is not necessarily what would be incredible at Jones Hall downtown, right? Not something that would make a really activating or, oh, what's going to come next concert, but something that's supportive of that healing environment. Um, One of our other pianists, Daner, um, who actually used to be a piano player at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. So that's a fun fact for the day. (laughs) Uh, I, I I brought my computer out of my office one day and I was just working in one of the lobbies and just needed a different space to kind of work. And I saw he was he was playing. Uh, he was playing beautifully. And a woman walked into the lobby space that was uh, really having a challenging moment. She was visually upset um, and she looked like she she was just really struggling. And without turning his head, without turning his body, he was able to kind of take that in and changed mid song into this spiritual song that created um, a much more healing environment for her to to take Mm -hmm. a moment in the middle of the day and really be able to process that. And so when we're looking at artists and when we're we're programming our spaces, we try um, to make sure that whoever's gonna be with us that day understands that the music is going to be helpful on their God, on, on our patient's journey or their, the music can guide people on their way and that we want to create an environment where people are able to take that journey and that we can go with them on it. And it's not just, you know, the greatest hits of Bach 24 seven, but it's music <laughs> that can um, meet people where they are. And we're in Texas. So sometimes that means country. We're also in mm. the med center. So sometimes that means international music because our, because people come from everywhere. Um, so that's our that's our arts integration. We also have an incredible visual arts program that falls in arts integration. And really our visual arts program came from an employee photo contest that we started about 15 years ago, um, where we asked employees to submit images to get put on the walls. Beautiful, great idea, love it, right? Um, it's easy. grown. It, easy. Let's let's all <laughs> do one. <laughs> so it's grown, and now we receive over a thousand submissions a year, Whoa. and we have to like fully adjudicate it. We have a pre-jury, <laughs> and then we have a jury, and then there's this large gallery space that gets filled up from it. But it, for us, it means employees, just like this image actually behind me, which podcast list, podcast listeners you cannot see, but. I will tell you, it's gorgeous. Um, And they're images from our employees that uh, give them an opportunity to give back to the soul of the hospital. So next to the photograph um, is their name and the unit that they work in at the hospital and maybe a little bit of information about them. So if I'm a loved one or if I'm a patient walking around the hospital, I can see that my nurse might not just be my nurse. She might be this incredible phlebo- or this incredible photographer. My phlebotomist might not just be a phlebotomist, but they might have this awesome, you know, arts background and really kind of uh, humanizing the experience by humanizing those that work in healthcare. Mm-hmm. So our um, our arts integration team is really they're just really worked super hard this past year to think about what the patient experience is and how we can use the arts in the most effective way to create a healing environment, especially in COVID when you can't do a lobby concert and people aren't walking around the halls to go look at the artwork. So really rethinking what happens in the patient room and how can I affect change in that? Mm -hmm. 
that's our second um, department. I have a couple more. Is anybody going to start Keep going the plug on my time? We're here. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> and then our so third sure. department are the creative arts therapies. And this one I'm so proud of as well. When I started at Methodist six years ago, we had one phenomenal music therapist. They were absolutely incredible. Taught me so much about how it could be how creative arts therapies could be effectively used in a hospital system. But now we have 12 music therapists. So in six years, we've grown from one to 12. And the reason that growth has happened, it's all been so organic because we'll put a music therapist or an art therapist on a unit, we'll have them embedded there. And that means that they're dedicated just to that one unit. They don't have to try to go around the whole 800 bed hospital, just that one unit. Um, And they get to know the unit and the patient population, and they're able to create these interventions that effectively meet the patient where they are, enhance, enhance their clinical goals, and especially this last year, are really serving the staff and are able to provide, maybe it's environmental music therapy, maybe it's a staff support group, maybe it's some creative arts intervention that they're able to use and do on a unit when they're having, when they experienced a, a traumatic death or when they're, the unit is just particularly stressed and they're able to use that training and effectively work in that space. So our creative arts therapies department, they're just, they're phenomenal. They're absolutely great. And then the last area that we have is our research area. So what makes CPAM a little bit unique is that all of this is embedded in a hospital environment, right? And when you're in a hospital environment, especially an academic institute like Houston Methodist, you have all these resources for research and minds that like to think outside the box and are willing to say, hey, let's, you know, I know all of this about brain imaging and you know all about this, all about music. Where, where can we combine on this? Oh, so um, I know it's so cool. Um, and our director of research, uh, Dr. Christoph Karmonic, has been with CPAM for a long time now, and he really is an imaging specialist. So his specialty is to look at, for us in particular, is to look at the brain and what's happening in the brain while you're listening to music or while you're viewing art and trying to take some basic science and then translate that to actual health. So one example that I'll I'll talk about is uh, our stroke study. So we started this project probably five or six years ago, and we were just looking at what is activated in your brain while you're listening to different kinds of music. So we put healthy subjects into an fMRI. An fMRI is a functional MRI. So it's like an MRI with crystal clear pictures is how I'm going to explain it. Um, We put healthy subjects into an fMRI and played them all kinds of different music. So we played Bach. We played their patient preferred or their uh, self-selected music. We played Gagaku. We played somebody reading a textbook. We played, you know, just all anything you could think of that was just different. We put all these healthy subjects in a fMRI. We're trying to see what we've come up with. We wanted to see well, is everybody's brain going to respond the same to somebody reading a textbook? Is everybody's brain going to respond the same to what 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 happens when you're listening to Bach? Or what what's going to look like this? What's going to happen out of this situation? So after that first round of study, we had our we had Dr. Carmonic look at the scans, and he basically said that if you that if you gave him a sample scan, he would be able to put it in a box of what you were listening to. So wow. I know, isn't that incredible? So what, what the scan shows is blood flow activation. So imagine a slice of your brain, right? You want your brain to be fully activated and you want the blood to be going to all these different parts of your, uh, of your, you want the blood to be flowing to all these different parts of your brain. So he was saying that by just looking at this one scan, he could say, oh, you were listening to Bach or, oh, you were listening to Gagaku, or you re- you watch somebody or listen to somebody read a textbook. And that was fascinating, right? We're looking at the different areas of the brain that are activated by different kinds of music. And I'm, mm-hmm. when I'm saying kinds of music, I should probably speak more specifically, but we were really looking at patient preferred or subject preferred music. So 
maybe your wedding song, maybe the song you sang to your kids as uh, they were growing up, maybe just like this jam that you, every time it comes on the radio, you're like, absolutely, 1980s, come <laughs> at me. Um, <laughs> versus different kinds of, maybe it was a classical piece, maybe it was a classical piece of music that you actually were watching the notes on the screen in front of you of the fMRI while you were doing it and how that was playing a role um, in where your blood flow was going. So we took that information and said, okay, this is great to know and fascinating and I love it, right? But how can this affect patients and how can this affect health? And we started our next version of that study, which is um, it's with stroke patients and it's still actively going on. So I'm not going to give you the final results yet, but stay tuned. We can't have breaking news here. This is what this podcast is about. And you're I ruining can. our You can have breaking news, but do you have the da 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 I'm not going to do it yeah, on this side It'll be edited in. <laughs> okay, never mind. I'm still not going to do it. <laughs> no. uh, but now the part of this study that we're working on are with stroke patients. Um, so what is music? Music can be a really easy intervention, right? You wouldn't necessarily have to come. So your stroke patient, you're treated, and then you're discharged to go home. And if, uh, family members and loved ones really want you to get back as healthy as you can. And we know with stroke patients that if we're able to activate different areas of their brain, they're going to be able to progress quicker um, and have a stronger chance at uh, the return to where they were neurologically before. So if we can do that through music, if we know, hey, this music is activating these different parts of my brain, that would be something that would be easy for families to be able to provide their loved mm. one. And so we've created, there's, there's, few different, uh, there's three different groups in this study. One are our control. So they have no spe specified listening list. Our second group are books on tape. Um, <laughs> and our third one are directed music listening playlist. So it combines patient preferred or subject preferred music and it, uh, uh, and it alternates between that and music that we've shown through these previous studies activate specific areas of your brain. So that could be an hour long playlist that goes from my favorite song growing up to this song that CPAM has, you know, data showing where it's activating. The next song could be my wedding song. And after that, just repeating back and forth kind of priming that brain and getting blood to flow to as many different areas as we can, um, which is, again, a really easy thing that we can do for patients that could make a lasting effect. So I'm going to shamelessly plug here, follow the Center for Performing Arts Medicine, join our email list, all of those things. And we really hope to have this study, COVID slowed it, slowed it down a little bit, but we hope to have this study completed and data out there sooner rather than later. Um, the data that we've been looking at and seen so far are really is really promising. So oh, yeah. fingers crossed, that would be a, such an awesome opportunity for us to care for those um, with neurologic conditions and use music as a way to help them on their journey. Obviously, it's, it won't take away damage, but it can help them on their journey towards wellness. So That's that amazing, Shay. 35, 45, 60 minutes in. That was my CPAM spiel. <laughs> the amazing. end. I think you answered every question we had. I know. I think I took all 25 years of CPAM and I just talked for all of it. <laughs> that was so that was so great, Shay. And we'll have to have you on again once those results are out, because I'm sure our listeners will be. I mean, I know I'm ex I'm curious to see what those results are. Because just for people who may not know about what a stroke is and how it damages the brain, can you speak to that a little bit and why, like, and why blood flow is so important? So we want to activate all the different areas of the brain. Um, basically, when you have a stroke, the one part of your brain, the, the blood flow isn't quite making it to that area. So if we're able to, just like you warm up your body before you go on, before you work out, or just like you're um, taking care of all aspects of your body, we want music and we, or we want blood to go to the different areas of your brain to allow those cognitive processes to happen. That's probably the easiest way to talk about it. Does that make Got sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yes, I think that was a good expression. Did you have something else? No, I was just going to say, and absolutely, we we would love to come back when 
those results are out. And I'd love for Dr. Kermanic to come on because this is yeah. really his specialty, right? Like yes. I'm here to be like a hype woman and say, <laughs> wow, this is so great and see how all of this combines. Because what what is specifically unique about CPAM is the way that all these programs affect the different populations in a healthcare environment. So we have arts integration programs for the public and for patients. We also have bedside programs for patients. We have um, employee arts enrichment activities. Just tomorrow, we have a poetry class for um, employees to be able to join for National Poetry Month and maybe try their hand at that. Um, and then this research element also allows us to look at what the future is going to be and how can arts and health be combined for the future of health and well-being and not just in, you know, when you're physically in a healthcare space, but how mm -hmm. it can affect your, your overall life cycle with the health yeah. system. Well, and that's what, kind of why we're here and the Arts for the Health That podcast is, you know, we know how important the arts are um and are continuing to learn more on a daily basis about how important the arts are for our health and well-being and yeah that's we have that same question of how how can we encourage people to in, to incorporate um arts engagement into a, just their a healthy lifestyle just like we do with good nutrition and exercise mm -hmm. and mindfulness all those things um that the arts should be a piece of that as well um and so I'd love for you to, you mentioned like the future. What do you see happening in the future for, for CPAM? That's such a good question. Um, I feel like I'm in a performance review right now. So I'm getting a little nervous. <laughs> where do you see yourself in five years? I'm going to look at my, where do I see myself in five years? Possibly <laughs> still on this phone call if you let me talk, keep talking. Um, <laughs> Listen, if we're around in five years, good for us. <laughs> <laughs> you will be, you will be. Um, well, I think so. So one of the things, one of the questions we get most at CPAM is that's awesome. And how can I start a CPAM, right? I'm in a mm. hospital setting. Maybe I have an arts background. Maybe I don't. But how can I start a, a CPAM? What does that look like? And I think for where I see CPAM in the next five years are we're taking these programs, right? We're a system center. So Houston Methodist has a campus in the Texas Medical Center, which is the world's largest medical center. I know I just keep dropping these nuggets today, right? <laughs> just <laughs> dropping these facts. Um, uh, so we have a hospital campus here in the medical center. We also have an academic institute that's attached to that right here in TMC. We have uh, six community hospitals, and then we have one long-term acute care center, so an LTAC, center, an LTAC hospital. Uh, all of our programs are system-wide, so we offer them at all of the campuses. But what I would love to see is that it's not just coming from the Texas Medical Center and going out, but each of these campuses has their own kind of CPAM staff embedded on those in those hospital campuses, really specific to what the culture there is, what the need there is, what's happening. Is there going to be a magnet thing? Should we have a magnet team over there? Um, we've done that with music therapy. So we have music therapists that are embedded at specific hospitals. Um, but I would love to see that on arts integration and education and outreach and maybe even research and really looking at that as an opportunity for us to grow from within um, and also empowering our healthcare professionals. I think, you know, over this last year, we've seen well, I like to think so. I hope somebody agrees. Um, our, oftentimes, healthcare professionals and artists are some of the first to raise their hand to say, how can I help? Yeah, mm -hmm. to pull me up on it. I, I want to try. I want to try. Um, so creating these programs at all of our campuses that allow healthcare professionals to see themselves beyond just what they do that day, so what they might do during their shift, but and allow opportunities for them to reflect through the arts in a healthy way that that um, to extend their career in healthcare. So if we're thinking about a shift nurse and she's had a really challenging shift that day, and it feels like oh my goodness, the walls are kind of caving in, or I'm or, or this is all just weighing really heavily on me. What are easy to access programs that we can provide for that? that individual or that unit that allows them to be more effective the next day when they come back? And how can we use the arts to empower people to think like that and continue on um, their healthcare journey, right, as a staff member, which is different than that as a patient? Uh, does that make sense to you guys? 
Yeah, that does. And to kind of tag on to that question, um, I think part of, you know, achieving a future where all patients could one day have access to these types of services, um, we really need healthcare policymakers and administrators on board. And I'm just thinking like, if, okay, I'm a hospital administrator. Okay, this sounds all like nice and fancy, but how do I pay for it? What's the benefit to the healthcare system? How do we how do we bridge that gap? And that may be too big of a question to just like throw in at the end here, but <laughs> maybe take a, a stab at it. Well, I would say you totally sound like a healthcare administrator, right? <laughs> How am I going to pay for it? What's it going to do? And who are those people? Um, which and maybe you've talked to a few administrators. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You might have experience in this realm. Um, well, I think that's a really good question. And um, my background before I came to CPAM was I worked in local arts uh, organizations, so arts advocacy. And oftentimes that job was sitting in City Hall and talking to mayor or council members and saying, hey, this is what we're doing and this is why it matters. And that experience, which was unique in itself, kind of prepared me to go into a hospital environment where 24-7, anytime you're in an elevator with somebody and those doors close and they say, what do you do for that? What do you do at the hospital? You get that opportunity to pitch. This is what I do, and this is why it matters. And here's an incredible story. And here's something that makes me wake up every morning and say, "Yes, I am ready to go to work." Um, and we have to look and be really specific to our audience, right? So one of the things I do in my job is look at our HCAP score. So before you start yawning promise. It won't be as long as the first spiel. Um, <laughs> I saw your cat yawn at me. Um, she just so, poked me and was like, is this over yet? Is, is, what's going on? Um, so HCAP scores are mailed or the HCAP survey is mailed to a patient after they leave the hospital. And it's basically this nationwide standardized um, survey on your experience in the hospital. The reason why that matters is the survey scores are directly related to the financial reimbursement from the government healthcare system. So let's say you both get an appendectomy. You get your appendectomy at hospital A and you get your appendectomy at hospital B. And hospital B is scores, let's say, 70 and hospital A scores 100%. That means that hospital A, even though you got the same procedure at the same time with the same kinds of clinicians in the room, hospital A is going to get compensated or reimbursed in a greater fashion than hospital B. Hmm. Okay, so that's okay. what that's why H caps matter. So what what we do here is we look through all the H cap scores and we look for citations on you know maybe it's photography maybe it's pianists maybe it's arts programs whatever those kind of citations that we could pull out from we look at those in the open comment section and then we'll also narrow in on units so for example i was recently reviewing them on an outpatient infusion unit um, that we have a music therapist on and really looked at what are the things that that therapist focuses on, like things like wait time, things like anxiety, and trying to track trends there so that I can go or so that we can go to that nurse manager or that director of that area and say, you know, look at this. Wow. In six months, we've been able to be a part of this transition. And here are our citations and here's our this. Oftentimes, if we're doing something really unit specific, we'll also do a personalized survey that patients, so if it was a music therapist that some of their patients would, would use as well. If it's a public program, we take HCAP inspired questions. So things like uh, uh, noise levels, uh, organization of a room, communication, things like that and ask those in a performance setting. So hmm. there's not going to be a direct, there's never going to be a question on HCAPS that says, and how was your arts program? Because <laughs> um, that is not universal, at least not yet. Not yet. Um, yeah, exactly. Fingers crossed. Next five years. Five years, uh, exactly. <laughs> um, but we are able to start making those ties and saying, you know, hey, this is what we're, these are the goals that we're after and this is how we're reaching them. We can also talk about how cost effective it is, um, especially with some of the other more uh, financially intense 
things that happen at a hospital, right? The arts programming can be a value added with not much of a cost attached to it. Um, and then we'll do the same thing for employee opinion survey. So turnover in a hospital is really a challenging thing nationwide. Nursing turnover particularly, um, and making sure that we're attra attracting and then retaining the best employees we can. And since so much of our programming is employee-based, we want to take a look at those employees and see how, you know, what are they responding to our questions on compassion fatigue or burnout, mm -hmm. resiliency? Mm -hmm. Are the programs that we're doing actually effective in that? And one story we have with um, the employee arts enrichment classes, this was again pre-COVID, um, but we took a group and our theme for the day was resiliency. We took a group from the hospital. We all got on the train. We went two stops down to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and we went and got a behind the scenes Van Gogh tour from Ooh. our friends over there. It was awesome. Cool. I was like, it sold out. Well, it sold out free, right? But it sold out. Um, <laughs> really quickly. And I was like, I'm really glad that I get a spot as a facilitator because this sounds amazing. <laughs> um, and so we were looking at the Van Gogh works and, you know, ev everybody that's coming that day has a different job in the hospital. There are people coming in scrubs. There are people coming on their days off. There are people coming straight from their administrative job. Like, right. That, that group is just diverse when you look at it, just diverse mm -hmm. in itself. Um, and we were looking at all the Van Gogh pieces and kind of having these conversations and I was like, wait, I was like, okay, but when is the teaching artist going to talk about resiliency? Like, when's that going to happen? Because that's the point of this class. <laughs> um, getting nervous over there. I was getting a little nervous. Um, they were doing a great job, but I was like, should I say something? Should I just yell resiliency and run off? Like, <laughs> um, and so we got to this this one image, irises, and it's a beautiful picture where there's um, this beautiful yellow backdrop and all these flowers kind of hanging out. And then there are these leaves that kind of like stick up straight up and down, like very angular. And we were looking at this and the a teaching artist says, and why would this be resilient? What's resilient to you about this image? And a booming voice from the back, I tell you, it was kind of like a magic movie moment. A booming voice from the back says, the leaves are. Everyone's paying attention to these beautiful flowers and the accoutrement, but the leaves are what's keeping everything up in place. Mm. And then we were ha able to have a conversation about what does that look like in your work environment? And how do you show mm. you're resilient when, you know, everything is patient centered and it should be, everything's about the patient and how we're able to care best for them in their unique circumstances. How can you be the leaves in that situation? So just a really wow. lovely example of, you know, we can take people, we can provide these experiences for employees. Um, but the magic happens when employees are also buying into it and saying, you know, this is important for me because, and this is how I can share what I know and, um, you know, bond with my coworkers and whatnot um, to have these unique experiences. Hmm. That's such a great story. Thank you. <laughs> I, have, I have two final questions. Okay. Well, I guess one has two questions in it. But anyway, uh, what does HCAP mean? And is it that every person who steps foot into a hospital for an appointment gets one? Or like, how do they just, who, who gets them? That's a really good question. So HCAPs are basically the patient's perspective of care study. So I'm going to say it slow. But HCAPs means Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems. I, you, <laughs> the Center for Performing Arts Medicine must have come up with that name <laughs> because it's a long one. There's a theme here. That's, I'm going to retitle Why this episode. Them age caps. Yes. Exactly. Actually, just don't title the episode. Just put letters in it, right? Just and then, like, see who comes. All the letters. It's going to be like a coding thing. Like, it'll be great. It'll be great. <laughs> Um, so there are, uh, I, I say age caps, but there are a couple iterations of that, whether you're inpatient, whether you're outpatient, behavioral health. Um, but age caps is just kind of how we can start the conversation about what a patient survey is. Um, and the important thing to remember with age caps are that it's nationwide. And so you are going to get the same survey that I get, regardless of where you are. 
Um, and that's in an effort to make sure that we're standardizing care and that you, you know, regardless of where you're going, it's understood kind of what that experience was like, which I think mm-hmm. is a really good thing. Um, HCAP scores are also um, really helpful for units. So let's say maybe you learn from HCAP scores that uh, it's something simple, like it's too noisy. Um, those are simple like policy things that we can change at a hospital. Like let's put in these quiet hours or let's work on, you know, maybe the food services trays don't need to go through the whole unit. Maybe we can just drop them off at the beginning and, and individually walk around things. Um, so it provides all sorts of good information for the healthcare um, organization itself. And speaking of when you're an artist or an arts organization and you're trying to be embedded into the fabric of a healthcare organization, using these markers that already exist and everybody in administration is going to be talking about them anyways, using those markers and finding ways to pull arts enrichment data out of that. It's just a value add. It's a win-win, mm. right? You're you're speaking the same language, and you guys are coming to the same. You're saying, "I want to get to that same place with you," and here's how I can be a part of that conversation. Mm-hmm. And our team here at Methodist, I mean, they have been so incredibly supportive. Like we kept everybody fully employed through the whole pandemic. Um, we're growing each and every year. Just the amount of support that we have operationally, philanthropically from our community. It's absolutely incredible. And and I want to give major kudos to Houston Methodist because mm. without that backing and without that saying, yes, you are right. The soul of the hospital is an important piece. Then then why be there? Right. Mm. And, and that's been the way from the beginning. Um, there's this mosaic that's now in our Bush atrium. So one of our newer towers um, and in the 1960s, it was installed on the front of the hospital. It's this beautiful mosaic. There's like 1.8 million pieces to it or something. So just a small piece, right? Um, it's huge. It the it's huge. <laughs> and they put it up at the front of the hospital in the 1960s. And then trees grew. And then they had to build a port a cache. And then the whole Texas Medical Center erupted. So it was kind of hidden and out of view. And it's this mosaic with Jesus in the center as Christ the healer. And it tells the story from left to right of medicine. So it starts Mm -hmm. with, um, you know, ancient medicine. Then you see Florence Nightingale. And then you see modern medicine from the 1960s, which is like a microscope. Um, (laughs) And you see an operating theater. And kind of it's telling the tale of like, you know, this is where we've been and here is where we are now. And when Walter Tower, when our newest tower was being constructed in uh, 2019, 2018, 2019, they actually took down the whole mosaic. They had to bring in this restoration company from Italy. They chopped it into 81 pieces, like this big mosaic. It was absolutely fascinating. I stood on the crosswalk and I watched it. Um, And then they... They took down each piece and they kind of cleaned it and they, you know, repurposed it, made it beautiful. And then now in the atrium, they've put up the whole mosaic inside so you can see it left to right. And it it tells the tale of not only modern medicine, but also Methodists believing from the beginning that art and um, artistic experiences can enhance the healing environment. And we Mm -hmm. don't just go, a hospital is not just a place outside of the community. But the best thing that we could do is is create a, a create a hospital that's integrated and accessible for various members of our community, regardless of who they are or where they're coming from. And so mm-hmm. using the arts as a conduit and using the arts as an opportunity to say, this is a space for all of us, right? This is let's talk about us. What do you what do you see in that mosaic? Is a is a great way to to make it a place that's not just for the sick, but a community-based organization. Mm. Wow. Powerful. You talked um, about the Serenity Room and you talked about poetry with the staff. Staff, uh, medical staff is notorious for not having enough time to do anything outside of caring for their patients and they don't understand how important that is to take care of themselves. Do you have something to end today, like a quick something, arts engagement that, that medical staff could do today to take a moment for themselves? That's a really good question. I feel like that was like a prompt for all of us. We're all like, excuse me, I'm going to pull out my watercolor set and then I will get back to you. Mm -hmm. You can pause this, go get your supplies (laughs) and then come back. 
But I think that, uh, you know, when we look at employee arts enrichment activities and we're trying to brainstorm about what people might like, um, we just, we try to think of, okay, what haven't we ever done before? What haven't we done in X years? And, and trying to make sure that we're creating a space for each individual employee and that you and I, we might not dig poetry writing, but next month when we're offering this Gregorian chant meditation workshop or whatever it is, it's going to appeal to a different group. So mm -hmm. one of the challenges working in this space is trying to always come up with um, an art activity. So for example, in January, we did a bunch of watercolor activities. In February, we um, found a bunch of different ways to celebrate Black History Month and what um, black artists have done to the arts community in the city of Houston and why it's mm. so vibrant and fantastic. Um, and we did a lot around Lunar New Year, trying to find different ways to connect to our diverse populations. Um, I would say, and maybe we can put it in the show notes, that we have a great series of guided meditations, mostly done by our music therapists, but some done from the rest of our team as well, that allows you to take five, five, six, seven minutes um, and using art and using guided meditation practices allows you to create this space of healing and create a little bit of a, a bubble inside your day before you move on to that next step. Mm. So can I send you those and maybe you can put them in yes, the show notes? Yeah, that would be great. Great. Yes. And, and how can they, how can people learn more about CPAM and connect with you if, if they want to learn more? Absolutely. So the easiest way to reach us is probably on our, uh, our, our newsletter, which is from the Center for Performing Arts Medicine at Houston Methodist. You can sign up for that online. Our website is www.houstonmethodist slash CPAM. I'll say it again like I'm leaving a voicemail. <laughs> www.houstonmethodist slash CPAM. Um, and you can also follow us on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, the Center for Performing Arts Medicine. Um, and there's always some fun virtual employee choirs. We just had our virtual employee choir do um, God Bless America at the Astros game home opener. Oh, cool. It was really fun. People just thought it was like our employees as well as people at the game just thought it was super cool. Um, mm. And so there's always opportunities there to connect virtually. And, and we'd love to hear from you and ideas on maybe what maybe what could be coming next. That's awesome. Well, make sure you come back when you figure out what's coming next. <laughs> No pressure, week. though, right? No pressure, but we'll see you next week. Um, Shay, thank you so much for joining us today and talking with us about what's happening there at the uh, at CPAM, the Center for Performing Arts Medicine at Houston Methodist. It's Shay Thornton Kula. Did I get that all that right? You got it all right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate our time together, and good luck on everybody's journey. And I hope everyone is well. There you go. We'll put all of the notes um, in the uh, all the notes and links. Uh, on our website, heartsneedart.org. Click on the podcast link, listen, watch. You can watch the YouTube so you can see the painting behind Shay when she talks about that. And uh, we will see you next week. Make sure you sub subscribe wherever you're listening or watching. Have a great day, everyone. Keep creating. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to Arts for the Health of It, a podcast produced by Hearts Need Art, creative support for patients and caregivers in partnership with the National Organization for Arts and Health. You can help others learn about the healing power of the arts by subscribing, sharing, and reviewing the podcast wherever you listen or watch. The podcast is hosted by Richard Wilmore, co-hosted by Constanza Rader, and produced by Ivan Briones. Our theme song, Songbird, is written and performed by Natalie Lane. Visit heartsneedart.org to learn how you can support our mission to create joy with people facing life-altering health challenges. Join us next week to learn more ways you can create arts for the health of it. The views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Hearts Need Art, their staff, board members, or other affiliates. All content is created for informational purposes only. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice or to diagnose and treat any health condition. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health professional with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you heard on this podcast.